Good morning. We're glad to welcome you to this first Lord's Day of a brand new year, 2021. And we especially want to extend a welcome to those who are watching uh, on Facebook, either now or later on a playback loop. We do pray that this will be a wonderful year for you to grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you will find through the power of the Holy Spirit, that strength to live even more faithfully and devoted lives for our Redeemer. 
We just want to mention one announcement today, and that is that following our service next week, we shall have a special meeting, and I should say a lunch, I believe that's correct, and that we will be able to have the building committee speak to you more about what is currently taking place. Well, let's lift up our voices now as we come to worship our God, and let's stand for the call to worship. From Psalm 135, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Let's praise our God by using selection 811. Another year is dawning. 811. Our Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you have formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you and you alone are God. We thank you for this year of opportunity to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. We ask that you would indeed bless this year of study and progress for the sake of uh, your dear son. We ask that you would receive us the worship that we bring at this first Lord's Day of a new year and that you would continue to humble us and to confess our sins as we do now quietly before you. O oh, living God of grace and mercy, we thank you that there is pardon and in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do ask, O Christ, that we would continue to remind ourselves of the gospel promises and reality all throughout this year, and that you would teach us to number our ways and to apply our hearts to wisdom each and every day, for you are wisdom, O Christ. We ask these things, Jesus, in your name, who taught us when we pray to say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue praising God with nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. 337. be seated and we look for our dear children to come forward at this time if they're with us today and come forward please children be careful of the carpet if you come forward we don't want it to slide and you go tumbling down Good to see all you children on this first Sunday of a brand new year I want to just start with this Bible verse today. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Children, what book is this that I'm holding? Exactly, the Bible. And we learned a few weeks ago the Bible's a special book. It's God's Word. God's Spirit inspired those writers to write. And they weren't sharing their opinions. They were, they were helping us to hear God speaking to us through His Word, the Bible. Now, today the question is this. Why? Why did God give us the Bible? The answer is this. And listen, there's two parts to it. We'll see if you can do it with me in just a moment. Why did God give us the Bible? God gave us the Bible to teach us about himself and to show us how to live. Let me say it again. God gave us the Bible to teach us about himself and to show us how to live. Now, I know that's two parts, and I'm wondering if you can say it with me now, okay? Why did God give us the Bible? God gave us the Bible to teach us about himself 
and to show us how to live. You know, there's much that God has to teach us in his Bible. He teaches us from Genesis to Exodus about his son, Jesus. Jesus is the one and only Savior, the Son of God who came down into this world to suffer and die for our sins. And did he remain dead? No, he rose again. And where is Jesus now? He's in heaven at whose right hand? Our heavenly fathers. See, the Bible teaches us much about Jesus. In fact, it teaches us there is no forgiveness except through the blood of Jesus, as we just sang. The Bible teaches us Jesus is the one and only Savior. The Bible teaches us that you must repent of your sins and believe upon him. But the Bible secondly teaches us how to live. You know, David in the Psalms once wrote, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, David knew that if he wanted to live a truly holy life, he needed the Bible because the Bible would teach him about God and how to live. And it taught him how to live a holy, humble life. But you know what? Did David live a perfectly holy life? Do you and I live a perfectly holy life? No. So the Bible tells us if you want to live a truly holy, happy, humble life, you look to Jesus. He did it for us. And you know what else the Bible teaches us? Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit through the power and the grace of of the Spirit, we can begin to live a holy and humble life. Children, why did God give us the Bible? God gave us the Bible to teach us about himself and show us how to live. Excellent. You know what, boys and girls, this is the first Sunday of a new year, and I want to encourage you to start reading your Bible for the new year. Now, I know you might say, but Pastor Zanz, I can't read yet. Okay, you know what? Who can read the Bible to you in your home? Mommy or dad, right? Ask them to read the Bible for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these dear, precious children. We ask that you would help them to learn about you and how to live for Jesus' sake. In his name we pray, amen and amen. You may go back, children. Thank you. <laughs> We're turning in our studies today of Revelation to chapter 21. Revelation 21. And let's give careful attention as we hear God's word. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold! The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls of, full of the seven last plagues 
and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the, 12, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and the and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured the wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was of pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made as a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city was has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but no Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word of truth and light. Bless us now, illumine our minds, fill us with the comfort that only Jesus can give us. For we ask this in his name, amen and amen. When I was a child, Walt Disney gave an interview. In that interview, he predicted what the world of tomorrow would be like. He noted that there would probably be little disease, pollution, crime, poverty, that uh, people will be able to commute to and from work in car slash helicopters. Since that day, many futurologists have weighed in about the world of tomorrow, and film directors are not left behind. They, too, have given us their vision of the future with their zombie apocalypses. And we also have the technocrats, the, the billionaires like Elon Musk, who is building his Hyperloop from the north to southern California, so you'll be able to travel up and down the coast within a, a few minutes. But today, we want to hear what God's view of tomorrow will bring, and it will be a whole renewed world. And we want to think upon that by considering initially the new heavens and the new earth. In our previous chapter, we read of the final judgment. You remember we saw that Satan, that deceiver of the nations at last, was cast into the lake of fire. He joined the other members of that unholy trinity, the false prophet and the beast who came from the sea. 
they and their minions have a future that is marked out by suffering. There will never be parole, release, commutation of their sentences. This is what theologians call the retributive justice of God. In other words, our sovereign God has given them according to their works. His divine justice for the elect, however, is that of reward, reward. Our God will not raise up our bodies and reunite them with our perfected souls so that we can live in a sin-cursed world. Instead, he, we will receive a new creation and guiding the apostle in that are the final chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. It's worth noting the placement of those passages in, the, in that prophecy. The book of Isaiah can be divided into two main sections, chapters 1 through 9, the Assyrian crisis where God delivered his people from those, peop from those enemies. But the second part is chapters 40 to the end. And here we find the covenant people for their breaking of the covenant, their idolatry and immorality, had received now the curse of the covenant. It was exile. They had been sent off to dwell in dreary and dark, idol-filled Babylon. But that's never the last word that God has for his people. The last word is always one of grace. And so the 40th chapter opens, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Their sins, which were many, had been forgiven and purged away. And Isaiah will explain how that transpires. It comes through that ultimate suffering servant, the one who was smitten and afflicted for, of God for our sake, the Lord Jesus. And the redemption that Christ brings is cosmic in scope, and it needs to be. For when Adam sinned in the garden, the penalty didn't just affect him or his immediate descendants, but as the catechism shows us, all of his descendants from ordinary generation. And beyond that, it has affected the very creation itself. You might recall how the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 reminds us that the entire creation is groaning to be set free. And this will come with the arrival of that last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom all things were created, is the agent of the new creation. And what do we mean when we say it's a new creation? What are the qualities that set it off as new? Well, we look at that briefly today by noting first the vocabulary. The word new here is not a, the Greek word neo, like neo-Gothic architecture, ancient architecture updated for our day and age. No, it is the word kynos, and that is a word that designates something that is new in its very nature and quality. The first creation in which we live today is marred by sin, and that will have passed away. What is coming is related to the past, but it is entirely, wonderfully renewed. There is a parallel here to you and me, Christian. Once we were dead in our sins, we were given over to sin in every type and form, and we were self-centered, selfish, ungrateful, foolish, and proud. But then we heard the gospel, and the Holy Spirit worked faith and repentance in our hearts, and we became followers of Jesus. Paul will tell us in 2 Corinthians 5 that if any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. And now in Christ, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit to live out the reality of that new creation. Of course, we don't do that perfectly now in this world. Each and every one of us still sins each day, and that causes us to drop to our knees and to mourn over our sins and to look anew to the grace of God to cleanse and renew us within. But we are looking forward, are we not? 
to that day when Jesus comes and he will raise us up. Our bodies, which had been sown in the ground in corruption, will be raised incorruptible. There is indeed continuity with the past. But there is all, everything will be new and renewed by the grace of our God. You see, God doesn't look at the creation and treat it like garbage and throw it on the trash heap. He loves his creation. He is determined to bring renewal to every aspect of that creation. Should he outright destroy the creation, that would be seen by some as something of a victory for Satan. You know how people would respond. They would sigh and say, well, maybe he didn't have that power after all to bring renewal. Or maybe he just lost interest and wasn't really that concerned and serious about about that word certainly not God in his gracious sovereign power will renew his creation and he is determined to fulfill that word for us now we can say secondly it's new the newness is brought out with the absence of the sea, the oceans as you know the oceans were a picture in the Old Testament they were a picture of creation itself and later nations in rebellion against God, foaming and raging like the waves swelling up and crashing. You remember one incident in the Gospels where Jesus was with his disciples in the boat and he stood during a raging storm and cried out, Peace! Be still! And those waves and winds stopped instantly. And I want to remind you that it is indeed a good picture of the demonic. For what did we read in chapter 13? Out of the tempestuous sea came that beast, the Antichrist, who brought and will bring much division and death within this world to God's People. The absence of the sea in the renewed cosmos is a powerful sermon. It's saying the peace of Christ has prevailed at last. It is there in every part of his creation. Thirdly, we notice that there is a holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down from heaven. She isn't like the old Jerusalem of this earth, that Jerusalem which always rebelled against God, turned its shoulder away from him, killed his prophets, at last slew his son who came to save her and wept over her. The new Jerusalem comes down from God. It is a work entirely of his grace and power and holiness permeates the air of that beauty beautiful city fourthly God dwells among his people and we were prepared for that when we read of the holy city you think of that adjective holy one place where we discover that in the Old Testament was with the tabernacle this was the token of God's holy presence literally among his people Israel camped it was four tribes here four here four here and four there they were surrounding God's tent and God was sending the message forth that I am Emmanuel living among his people it's that message that Ezekiel picked up upon and used when he spoke of the future this is what he said. I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God's eternal dwelling will not, I repeat, will not be in heaven, but with us who at last will be on a renewed earth. What John is presenting for us here is a picture a prophecy and a promise of God dwelling intimately with his people. But fifthly, we see the newness here with the effects. Everything that characterized this first fallen creation will have been purged away. Quoting Isaiah 25, the apostle reminds us that God himself 
will wipe away all tears. And there'll be no reason for us to weep in a new Jerusalem. There'll be nothing there to upset us, to cause us pain in the least. In fact, that old enemy, the, all, the last enemy known as death, will have been put to death and removed forevermore. Isaiah will emphasize this in his 65th chapter. There is thus no reason, none whatsoever, for you or I, Christian, to doubt that this will come. God sits on the throne, and he assures us that in his Son he will make all things new. And what a wondrous creation it will be. Never again will we be a thirsty people, but we will enter into that renewed creation, drink freely, abundantly of the best water the water of God, the water of life that he gives his people. And in that city, God's promise long ago made to David will be fully realized for us. He will treat us as his dear sons and daughters. And to underline these blessings, John reiterates that this is not the future for the ungodly. Theirs is one of judgment and the lake of fire. But this portion of the vision where the saints have glory before them has a purpose. It is designed to encourage you and me, Christian. We live in a fallen and a hostile world, and we can often become confused and beaten down and intimidated by it, and we can become despairing and even think, is this the way it's always going to be? And John holds before us this lovely picture and says, no, you have a new heavens and a new earth awaiting you. You will have that unbroken and most intimate fellowship with God and with his Son, and you will be with all who have loved and who have longed for the appearing of Jesus. You will be with them from every nation, tribe, and tongue whom Christ has ransomed with his own blood. But I want us to look at a portion of that new creation, secondly, today, with the New Jerusalem. When you or I visit a national park or a museum, we often encounter tour guides. Their role is really twofold. They are to take us from one exhibit or place to another, but they are also to explain to us what we are looking upon. What is the significance of this site and this one? Earlier, we had an angel appear to John, and you remember he showed him the great prostitute. You recall that was the imagery that John had for that fallen and wicked city of Babylon. And how fitting. Babylon has sought to seduce the nations over the years. The city of man always seeks to seduce people with its offers of prosperity and popularity. It seeks to seduce us with false religion and promises of security there. And you might recall that the prostitute, of course, had no husband to love, to cherish, to protect her, and consequently she was destroyed, as we read, by the, uh, the counterfeit Christ and his followers. But now an angel has the privilege of showing John this new and enduring heavenly city, and she is bridal. Behind this bridal imagery is the prophecy of Isaiah 61. Think context, and you'll quickly understand why. Isaiah, in that passage, was setting before us the final state of the church. And what better picture to depict the joy and the intimacy that God wants us to have than that of a wedding. And this bride... She has the superlative husband. In fact, he is the model for all of us Christian husbands, the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what Paul said in Ephesians 5? Husbands, 
Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Christ cherishes his bride and makes sure that she does not appear in the tawdry attire of the prostitute, but in fact is dressed in that gleaming garment which reflects the holiness and the righteousness of our Savior himself. And here John is permitted to see this sight by being escorted to a high mountain. Now I have to tell you, first century readers would have recognized, here's the prophecy of Ezekiel again. You remember back previously we noted that Ezekiel uh, spoke of a battle involving Gog, his nation Magog, and he gathered a confederation of rebellious nations. They were to swoop down from the north upon God's encampment, his beloved city, but what did we find? God in his fiery wrath consumed them, and their unclean remains were left on the field for the birds of the air. Ezekiel was painting a picture that John knew that was pointing to the final battle when Satan is released from his prison after a thousand years and there he comes with his enemies against the church and he too is crushed and left with a humiliating uh, defeat. And after that scene in chapters 38 and 39, in chapter 40, John, uh, Ezekiel is lifted up on this high mountain, and he beholds a beautiful temple, the church. John is again tapping the imagery of Ezekiel, and what he wants us to see initially is the glory, the glory of God with her. Consider, for instance, the glory of God that long ago descended upon the tabernacle and the temple. In fact, in the latter example, when God's effulgence filled the temple, the holy priest of God had to flee. They were too overwhelmed by the sight of God's glory. Christian, the spirit of glory has descended upon the church, the true temple of Christ of, uh, in this world, the body of Christ. And the Spirit of glory, the Holy Spirit, resides in each and every one of us as members of that body. And that's why our individual bodies are temples to uh, the Lord himself. And so we find here that the church experiences the glory of Christ, and we want to underscore as we find in the Psalms, it's a transformative glory as we are there in the presence of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are changed. We are changed from one degree of glory to another. Not only is there glory, but there is, secondly here, beauty. A beauty that is exquisite to behold. It's the beauty of Holiness. You remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 93, Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. This is that inner spiritual beauty. Peter picked up on that type of theme. You remember when he exhorted Christian women, he said, do not be like the unbelieving women who are concerned about apparel and gold and braids in their hair and all that, but you focus upon the inner beauty, that meek and quiet spirit. That is what is beautiful to God. And this is what we're finding here, the beauty of holiness for the entire bride of, of Christ. Christ, the church. There is thirdly here to be found security, security. We read here of high, thick, impenetrable walls and gates. And you'll notice guarding the gates are not even glorified men, but a superior force, celestial beings, angels who are servants of God's serve, of God's elect. They are there again in that capacity as servants and guardians, making sure that nothing and no one unclean will ever enter into that city. There is not only security there with those gates and walls, but there is also unity 
unity. Did you notice on the walls are the names of the 12 tribes and on the gates are the names of the 12 apostles? What a powerful way to communicate the unity of the church. The church is one body throughout the generations. As Paul would say, one, uh, one God and Father, one Savior and Lord, one baptism. The saints of old were looking forward to God fulfilling the promise the promise that he would send the seed of the woman to redeem us. And as the years unfolded, God added to that promise. He is now the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. He is the everlasting God, the Prince of Peace himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you and I, on this side of the cross, look back and we say, everything that God forecasted of his Son has come to pass. He has suffered, and he has died for us. He's been raised for our justification. Christ is now in heaven, reigning over the entire universe. The church is one throughout the ages, united in that common profession of Jesus Christ, Ezekiel. And now John, tapping that imagery, has set before us something of the beauty of this heavenly city, the glory of God inhabiting it. There is security and the beauty of holiness as well the unity of the faith. But I want us to look here thirdly at the city's measurements and adornment. Between verses 15 through 21, John develops two ideas. First is the measurement of the city. And once more, I have to say, he is borrowing from Ezekiel chapter 40. The difference is the dimensions in John's version surpass what was there in Ezekiel's vision. In English, the 12,000 stadia is roughly 1,360 or so miles. It's a distance that is equivalent from Miami to Detroit. That's not only its length, but its width and its height. It's the city four square. New Testament scholar Greg Beale has written that in antiquity, this four-squared concept denoted integrity, completion, perfection. And we were made aware of that when we carefully read through the Old Testament in such places as Exodus 26 or in Ezekiel 41. What do I mean? the Holy of Holies. That inner sanctum was cube-shaped, indicating the perfection of our God. And this is one reason why in the new heavens there is no need for a sanctuary, because the entire city will be sacred space. The holiness of God will be found on every avenue and uh, back alley. The holiness of God will diffuse throughout this holy Jerusalem. There's not only the measurements here, but there is the adorning of the city. In verses 18 through 21, John mentioned 12 different precious jewels. And once more, we look to the Old Testament for insight. For example, in Exodus 28, eight of those jewels are found on the high priest's golden breastplate, where each of the names of a tribe of Israel was inscribed on it. And this is conveying to us the idea, of, again, of the holiness. The holy city is holiness unto the Lord. But we can go further back in the Bible to the opening chapters of Genesis, where we find some of these beautiful and precious stones. And this reminds us that the new creation will be even more lush, more beautiful than what was there in Eden. You remember how Paul speaks of this? Eye hath not seen, nor ear hath heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. When we arrive in that new creation, no one 
will sigh disappointment. Our breath will be taken away from us by its beauty. But then let's look here, fourthly, to the light of the city. There is one ultimate, ultimate reason this heavenly city has no temple, and what is that? Well, remember what we've seen thus far. God's temple conveyed His glorious presence. The saints in this holy city are now always in the presence of God. And it's a reminder that He kept His covenant. That word to dwell with us. Ezekiel promised, as we heard earlier, that God would one day dwell forever with His people. And in fact, if you advance to Ezekiel 43, the city is given a new name. And do you know what it is? It's this. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. With the presence of God and His Son, there will be no need for the sun in the sky or the moon by night because that city will be continuously bathed in the glory of God and the light of Him who is the light of the world, our Lord Jesus. And the nations, by God's grace, will see her radiance. As Micah said, they will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. The elect from the nations will stream to this city with joy. They will pour through those gates without any thought that they might be molested, mugged, or murdered. No one will be a crime statistic in that renewed city. And when they come, they will come like the Queen of Sheba did long ago when she came up to Solomon's city of peace with lavish gifts, but... No one will think that by their gifts they are somehow enriching the king because he's the king of the cosmos and he owns everything, even those who bring the gifts to him. He owns them in body and soul and life and death for it was his precious blood that was shed that purchased their redemption. Their gifts instead are a token, a token of their gratitude for such a great salvation they have received freely in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But you'll note this chapter ends with a reminder that nothing unclean will enter except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, why does the chapter end with that allusion to Isaiah 52? Well, he suggests to you two reasons. And the first is assurance. Assurance. We live in a fallen world, and our experience has been, whether you're talking New York, London, Moscow, Beijing, Pittsburgh, the cities of men. And what have we seen with these cities of men? Oh, they started with noble intentions that they were going to build a beautiful city. But what has ended up happening throughout the centuries? They've all been corrupted. They've all experienced the leavening effect of sin, corruption in City Hall, corruption in the people. You see the evidence of it with the broken families, the broken lives, the sense of despair that hangs over the city of men. And within us is the thought, is that going to happen with the city of God? And the answer is a resounding no, for the Lord is there. It is His almighty presence and grace that will preserve this city. This city will never see corruption, but it will in fact continue to grow and to flourish and to continue to shine forth with the power and the grace and the glory of Jesus. We need that assurance that we are not going to another city that is built by fallible men, but we are going to the city of God, whose builder and maker is God himself. But I suggest to you this reminder here is for another reason, and that is the gospel. 
if you desire to be in that renewed creation in that city, then understand this. You must in this world confess Christ. There is no post-death conversions. No one is converted in the grave. The gospel is for this day, this age, and it calls us to recognize that in Adam we are unclean, that we need to come to God and to say, I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. I am a filthy sinner, and quite frankly, I don't even grasp the filthiness of my own sin. But thanks be to God. He has sent his son Jesus into the world. He who knew no sin became sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God, the apostle says. Christ was lifted up on the cross, bearing our shame, our guilt, and the filth of our sins. It is only through the blood of Jesus, as we sang, that we can be cleansed from all our sins. But not only the blood of Christ brings cleansing, but what Paul says in Titus 3, that we have the inward washing and renewing of the Holy Spirit, the double cure, as the hymn says, the blood, the Spirit of Christ washing us so that we can be seen now as God's beloved sons and daughters and take advantage of all the privileges that are given to us and that privilege is that we will enter through the gates and we will come into that city with the elect of the nations. We will lift up holy voices and sing to the Lamb himself. This is our vision. This is our hope as we are looking forward to being with God and with his son there and dear friends the only way that can be for you is as we said if in this world you acknowledge your sin and your need of cleansing that you come to Christ and confess your sin and put your faith and trust in him and through the power of the Holy Spirit now now go forward and begin to live a truly thankful life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful picture of the future for the people of God, and we ask that you would cheer our hearts by it, that you would help us to realize it is far more wondrous than this feeble preacher can even begin to expound. We ask that you would continue to cheer us by with it each day in this new year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. At this time, our ushers come forward to receive your offerings. Freely you have received, freely give.
Son and Holy Ghost, we thank you for that we can gather here today and bring these offerings. We do pray that you would continue to fill our hearts with joy for the wonderful gospel that you have given to us, freedom in our Lord Jesus, forgiveness forever with him, new creation now and in the world to come. Hallelujah. We ask that you would bless both gift and giver today, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing uh, before we come to the communion table. It's number 324, 324. The first two stanzas, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Stanzas one and two.
let's look to our God now as we come to the communion table of our Lord Jesus and we sing, uh, excuse me, sing, we are going to be reciting the Apostles' Creed together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Once more, we have the joy of coming to the Lord's table. It is a spiritual feast for us, and we begin the year in the Lord's house and at his table, and that is a great privilege for us indeed. I'm reading from the words of institution as they are found in Matthew's gospel. Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat this is my body and he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink all of it you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins I tell you I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom this is known rightly as the Lord's table it's his table and he sets the terms as to who may come and eat and drink in remembrance of him. And the qualification has nothing to do with our age, our, a, our sex, our, our uh, uh, education, or any such things like that. The sole qualification is, do we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And so we want to invite you who may not yet be members of our church, but are visiting or otherwise who are here with us, we want to encourage you, if you have professed faith in the risen Lord Jesus and believe in your hearts that he is your Savior and Lord and desire to live for him, and you can take the words of this creed we just confessed to heart and mouth, then we urge you to come to the table. We also want to extend a warning to those who have never made such a confession. Don't come to the table out of some superstitious idea that this will make you holy. This table is not a converting ordinance. It is for those who have already been converted by God's grace. It is for their continual renewal and strengthening. And so we urge you to let the elements go by and take this time to think upon your own sins as we all must, and turn and look to Jesus and to him alone for salvation. As we come to the table today, I want us to look to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Christ, we thank you for not only dying and rising for us, but giving us feeble, finite saints this meal. We are grateful for this visible sermon that reminds us of your great love and death for our sins. We praise you, Father, for the gift of sending your Son to pay that price for our redemption. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes to see these things. And we thank you that you will separate as much of these elements as we use from a common to a holy purpose to feed our hunger for Christ and to quench our thirst for him. For we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen and amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, had taken the bread, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples as we give to you today the bread of our Lord. Our Lord Jesus also took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, gladly will give to you the cup of salvation. I believe that you have already received these elements. If you haven't and you still need some, 
then our elders will come and give you those at this time. From the book of Revelation, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Christian, hear the word of Jesus. Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. <clears throat> Drink ye all of it. Let us look to our God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your marvelous grace in Jesus. We are rejoicing that we can start this new year at the table, thinking back upon what he did for us so long ago at the cross and in his triumphant resurrection, and yet at the same time looking forward to when he returns and takes us unto himself that where he is, there we shall be also. Help our hearts not to be troubled, but to remember that he has gone ahead to prepare a place for us, that where he is, there we may be also. We ask that you would continue to encourage, strengthen, nourish our souls, that you would strengthen us to be the men, the women of God that we need to be in this darkening generation. 
that we would live truly holy lives, not looking to rules and rituals of men, but to the ruler of men and women, the Lord Jesus, whom John tells us he is full of grace and truth. Give us the grace, Lord Jesus, to live for you in this day. We ask these things in your powerful name. And God's people said, Amen. Let's sing the last two stanzas of the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. be seated and we look to you at this time if you have items that you'd like to mention for prayer joys and concerns let me just mention a couple quickly we want to continue to remember to pray for Liz in this time of mourning for her late husband and we ask that you would also continue to remember in prayer Clarence and Colleen the, about their housing situation and I will let Colleen address I think that's her I don't have my glasses on so <laughs> I think that's Colleen um, and then I was told that Edie yesterday celebrated her Jenna I say or okay the daughter said it is fine her 90th birthday so we give thanks to the Lord for that Any, uh, any other matters? Um, my name's Christy. Um, I am feeling very, very blessed, as is my mother, Sue. Um, my mother is Sue LeClaire, if you don't know. Um, she was finally able to get out of the hospital about two weeks ago, and we're very blessed that she is recovering well, and she's started therapy and she's doing very very well and we just thank everybody for the cards and the prayers Amen. and i am also very grateful to be sitting next to my friend today <laughs> sherry it's good to have her back amen amen This is Colleen. I would like to ask for prayer for the family of Dorothy and Lindsay. She passed away yesterday morning. This is Betty. First praise is, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, amen? <laughs> My Bethel family is so very precious. Amen. Lots of different things have happened over the season, but praise God, God is on the throne. First, I want to give thanks for all of you who express sympathy on the death of my brother, Dale. But praise the Lord, he's no longer bound by Alzheimer's. He's up there singing with Ivan in the choir. <laughs> they were in a quartet together. Um, I also want to just give thanks for God's faithfulness. It is seen through the eyes, through the cards, and through your prayers. Praise God. Just praise God. This is Angelo. Uh, just pray for Awana ministry as we start this, uh, this week. This 
This is Patty. Um, I would like you to pray for um, the family of Cindy Snyder. Um, she's a classmate of mine that died in. It was Dr. Martin and Pat uh, Martin's uh, daughter. So Pat Martin's daughter. So just pray for her family. Yes, I, I'm, this is Carol. Um, we lost a very, very dear friend this week, uh, yesterday, uh, Loretta Leslie. So if you could pray for Loretta's family, Charlie, and, and all the kids, just thank you for your prayers. Let's look to our God in prayer. Let's do so. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you and to lift up our voice and praise. We are so grateful that Christine's mom, Sue LeClaire, is doing better. And each day making progress, we pray that you would continue to bring that healing and encouragement to her. We ask, too, that you would receive our praise that Sherry is with us and that she has been uh, experiencing healing each and every day, and your goodness is so evident there in her life and testimony. Father, we also thank you uh, for uh, the uh, birthday for Edie, and we are asking that you continue to watch over her and continue to help her to give praise to you as she so uh, likes to do. Our loving God and Father, we ask you to be with Clarence and Colleen as they are getting uh, this new home in order, and we pray that this would uh, come together for them quickly. Our Father, we pray for Dorothy's family, uh, and we ask that you would bring them comfort and help in this time as well, the Martin family in a time of bereavement, and for also Loretta's family as she passed away and for Charlie we ask that for all these families who are going through this time that you would be with them and encourage them we thank you for the dismissed brother who has been in the hospital and is making progress and we ask that that would continue to be the case we lift before you Liz and we are thankful that she is giving a testimony of your grace in the passing of George and we ask that each day she might know your presence our God we do pray that you would be with uh, the Awana Club as it desires to restart this coming week and that we might have a wonderful blessing uh, for those dear children father we think not only of ourselves but we think of your saints scattered throughout the world in our mission news today we've read about uh, the country of oman where islam is the state religion and yet there is much freedom there perhaps more freedom there than some other countries in the mid east and so we pray for the church to grow there and to flourish that many will come to faith in the lord jesus christ we pray for these precious girls that were abduct abducted in egypt that they may be returned to their families Families, that you would rescue them from the sex trafficking industry. Our God in heaven, we pray today that the gospel will go far and wide throughout the world and that many will come to faith in Jesus, that they will join that everlasting throng that will be before the throne. And we ask that you would bless the preaching of the word here on the internet, in various other venues, the radio, television, that millions may come to hear of Christ and his love. Be with us now, we do pray, our Lord, and that you would continue to guide and lead us. For we ask these things in your blessed name, O Christ. Amen and amen. Our final selection, The Power of the Cross. <laughs> Thank you. 
before us, Christian, and remember those beautiful words, what a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen.